In this lesson, we are going to talk about pyelonephritis, which there's nothing fancy about this word. It really just means infection in the kidneys or inflammation in the kidneys. Most often it is from bacterial infection either inside the kidney or inside the renal pelvis itself. You can either have acute pyelonephritis or you can have chronic pyelonephritis, which is often caused from repeated or continuous upper UTIs. We really need to separate pyelonephritis into two categories. First, acute pyelonephritis and then chronic pyelonephritis. In acute pyelonephritis, there is acute tissue inflammation which occurs causing tubular cell necrosis and possible abscess formation. These pockets can form anywhere in the kidney and healthy tissue can be right next to unhealthy tissue. <clears throat> it is often caused from the bacteria that will reflux up into a bladder. It can also be caused because of say a catheter would be inserted or maybe a patient had a uh, cystoscopy performed. So any kind of manipulation of the urinary tract puts a patient at risk for acute pyelonephritis. Now chronic pylo is commonly um, due to reflux from the urine, either from the bladder or from the ureters. This is very bad because repeated infections can cause scarring and inside the blood vessels, glomerular cells and tubular structures, structures will begin to change and not filter blood as well. Oftentimes, patients will develop chronic pyelonephritis, maybe because there is some structural deformity, say from birth, or maybe over time they have had um, long-standing issues that have not been resolved from BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, or maybe they've had multiple renal calculi or kidney stones. Patients can develop chrono, chronic pyelonephritis even from having diabetes. They will have a neurogenic type bladder and the urine will not just empty and we know what happens with static urine. It's prone to infection and in time it can reflux up the bladder if there's a lot in there. We can also develop cryo, uh, chronic pyelonephritis from prolonged use of NSAIDs. That's that blank there. So a patient who just used ibuprofen maybe for their arthritis for a long time is at risk for developing this condition. Maybe they take NSAIDs for their lupus. That also puts them at risk for it. <clears throat> um, most common organism that uh, can cause pyelonephritis in either of these cases, whether it's acute or chronic, is going to be E. coli. That's right, E. coli. And we know where that comes from. That's right, the GI tract. And the other one is called enterococ Enterococcus faculus. I know, I said it correctly. I double checked. Enterococcus faculus. Well, once again, those are both from the GI tract um, and they can cause either of these conditions. Now, bloodborne infections can actually migrate into the kidneys, like they go from, say, a wound into your bloodstream, into the kidneys, but this is a little bit sort of the rare type of pyelonephritis. Last, autoimmune conditions do lead uh, to cases of pyelonephritis. The one that I'm thinking of is lupus. So what is her patient gonna look like? What are we gonna notice if we walk in the room and see them? Well, it really kind of depends on which type of pyelonephritis the person has. If they have acute pyelonephritis, we are going to see on, um, on our patients the typical UTI presentation. They're going to have the fever, the chills, the tachycardia, hopefully not low blood pressure because that would indicate urosepsis. But what's going to be very unique about pyelonephritis is that they're going to have costovertebral tenderness or costovertebral angle tenderness. So up in their back, we are going to gently palpate it and we may notice that that elicits uh, a painful stimulus to their patient. 
We are able to, if we palpate it and uh, they don't feel anything, we could percuss to see if that, um, you know, will elicit some pain. But uh, that is one way, unique way we can tell if they have pyelonephritis or infection in the upper urinary system. Um, we, with most UTIs, will have the abdominal discomfort. They'll have nausea, urinating throughout the nighttime. Um, general malaise and fatigue is not uncommon to have in our patients with just UTIs in general, but it will definitely be present if they have acute pyelonephritis. Great. Uh, our manifestations for our chronic pyelonephritis, now we're going to see every bit of the acute signs and symptoms. However, they're going to be less dramatic. They're not going to be as um, obvious to us. So a patient will say meh <laughs> on a lot of your answers. What we are going to see is that they are going to be hypertensive, right? They are going to be hypertensive. And this is because the kidneys have lost their, in it, their ability to conserve sodium and regulate the aldosterone renin angiotensin system very well. So they're going to be urinating a large amount of urine. And we are going to be seeing a lot of fluid loss in their urine and a lot of sodium loss in their urine. So oftentimes what we'll do with these patients is do a 24-hour sodium collection. And we sort of know how much sodium should be passed in a, somebody's um, urine per day. But if it's excessively high, mm, we might have a case of um, you know, chronic pyelonephritis if it's from an infectious source. So they're going to have... Lots of sodium in the urine and lots of water, right? Um, and our patient may have some acid-base imbalances. We may see metabolic acidosis. Let's see if there's anything else I would like to add. Oh yes, um, they may people who have either acute or chronic pyelonephritis, so it doesn't matter. Um, we're going to see redness or edema right in that costovertebral angle. We may see redness or edema right there on their back in their costovertebral angle. Okay, this is where you get to have the fun part. You get to feel like the investigator asking all these questions to your patient. So, um, Patient, have you any history of diabetes? Yeah, no. Okay, no. How about a history of stone disease? Because we do know patients who have, say, struvite stones uh, are often formed in the presence of chronic UTIs. Maybe you've had a stone before? No? Hmm. Okay. Do you have any GU defects, some genitourinary defects? Like you, do you still feel like you're able to? Uh, you know, empty your bladder. Here, let me palpate your bladder. Is it distended? Hmm. Okay, no. Um, do you possibly have HIV? Are you on chronic immunosuppressive therapy, say for your lupus or your psoriasis? Because we know that may also cause um, pyelonephritis. No. Hmm. Maybe it is from sex. Yes, absolutely. In fact, we are going to see, um, we're going to ask our patients if they have any particular sexual habits or practices that may introduce bacteria into our uh, urinary tract. Um, certain uh, practices include anal sex and then vaginal sex and then uh, certain positions such as where the partner is approaching from behind. That can also bring bacteria right on over. You can notice if you're, if this is a possibility, if your patient has vague, non-specific responses to your direct questions. Um, so you can just encourage your patient to tell uh, their own story in a familiar language of how they think that they continue to get these UTIs. So for diagnostics, <clears throat> We are going to grab a UA on this patient, and what will they be positive for to indicate a UTI? Mm, cricket, cricket. 
I know you are saying that they will have positive leukocyte esterates. They will more than likely have positive nitrates on their dipstick. And if we were to do a macro microscopic look, we're going to see that they are uh, three plus for white blood cells, three plus for red blood cells, and they will probably test positive for bacteria. In fact, if they if we were to culture it and they were uh, and we saw that they were greater than a hundred thousand in their colony count, we would definitely run a sensitivity on this test. Now, because the infection is so high up in the kidneys, we're going to notice some additional things on their urinalysis. We're going to see excessive amounts of cast. Cast. This means shedding of cells, possibly kidney cells, possibly um, um, red blood cells, a little bit of so white blood cells. So you're going to see like shreds and pieces of cells. So those are called cast. <clears throat> We're also going to notice that they're going to be positive for protein. So our patients can have protein urea. This means that our kidney is under stress. We do not like this if we see protein urea. Bad, bad symbol. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but this will let us know that an infection is affecting the kidney's function because it's not able to process those amino acids and filter them and keep them in. It's actually letting them through which is not good, once again. If we were to grab our CBC, I'm not technically going to see anemia or low platelets, no thrombocytopenia, thrombocytopenia but I will see leukopenia uh, with our high white blood cells. Okay? Actually, I think I said that backward. Yeah, it's not leukopenia. That's when it's too low. Hmm. I think the proper word for it is leukocytosis. You know what? We'll scrap that word. We're going to see a height white blood cell count. How about that? All right, blood cultures. Let's grab a set of blood cultures and we're going to see it for one of two reasons. We're going to see if the infection is bloodborne or maybe if the patient um, has urosepsis, meaning it's gone from the kidney to the bloodstream. It's kind of really hard to tell which one came first, the chicken or the egg, but we usually do grab blood cultures. That helps in the uh, selection too for antibiotics. All right, C-reactive protein. The C-reactive protein or CRP and the ESR, which is the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, is very important because we want to determine the presence and extent of inflammation inside the body. We will do these sort of at different time periods to know if our treatment is effective or not effective. Hopefully the trend is these are going to go down after we begin treatment. Okay. The KUB x-ray is going to be looking specifically for stones. Which stones are translucent again? Hmm. If you answered cysteine, you are correct. And we are going to do CT scans as well as the cystourethrograms. This is going to let us know if there is some genetic deformities inside our patient. And we can detect if our patient has hydronephrosis or maybe a hydroureter where there is some kind of um, backup of the urine. And that cystourethrogram will let us know if there is um, reflux that occurs. Remember how that works? You lay the patient down, insert a catheter, fill the bladder with contrast, and then you watch them pee on x-ray. Right. It's actually kind of fun. So our patient has pyelonephritis. What are we going to do? Well, regardless if it is acute or if it is chronic, we're going to make sure our patient gets some broad spectrum antibiotics. Once we run the culture and sensitivity in about 24, 48 hours, when results come back, we are then going to switch them over to narrow spectrum um, antibiotic therapy. For their food, well, we want to make sure this person is getting adequate calories. Oftentimes our patients with chronic pyelonephritis just have, um, you know, that they don't want to eat. And we know what happens if our 
nutrition system or nutrition is poor oftentimes it affects our immune system so we want to make sure we are getting enough calories and we are actually going to have our patient with chronic pyelonephrosis polynephritis uh, decrease their protein intake right we are going to decrease their protein intake for uh, just a little small time period um, we want to make sure we do um, fluid therapy they need to drink so their urine remains clear I know our patient with chronic pyelonephritis is going to have that inability to conserve water and sodium but we need to make sure they're not going to get dehydrated so we need to keep up with the fluids maybe about two liters per day unless there's some contraindication uh, surgery wise we do have multiple surgery options for people with pyelonephritis maybe we can do a pyelolithotomy or uh, which we're, we're going to remove a stone that could be obstructing the urine to flow on down. Hopefully not a nephrectomy. This is our last resort if the infection is so bad in the kidney and we actually have to take the kidney. But, um, you know, of course, that is always the option. There is um, the possibility of doing a ureteral diversion if, say, there's so much scarring from a patient who has had BPH. Um, remember, one of the things that those patients can have is trabeculation, which means um, like lots of ridges inside the bladder and it's just causing constant UTIs and now we're going to kidney failure. Oh my goodness. You know, maybe that patient needs to have ure uh, ureteral uh, diversions such as a urostomy, um, if not temporary for a time, a six months or so, maybe permanent. I've seen that in one situation because a guy's BPH was such an issue and he was getting way too many pyelonephritis and he almost went on dialysis for life. So um, for our younger population, reimplantation of the ureter, if it is a genetic uh, malformation, that can definitely help. The procedure is called a ureteroplasty. So the ureters should actually attach. Um... Sorry about that. <clears throat> so possibly we need to replace the ureter from its abnormal location. Maybe it's uh, not at the uh, correct place and that's why our urine is ref refluxing up and we need to restore the proper drainage flow. Um, and as always, let's remember to take, um, take a moment to teach our patients the role of antibiotics making sure they go through the whole regimen. Um, our patient with chronic pyelonephritis is going to be on antibiotics for at least six months, maybe three months, <clears throat> and they are going to do um, frequent urine specimen samples. So we're going to see if they are going to stay negative. If we need, say, some reinforcements for our nutrition, because they're going to be on a low protein diet, let's call in a dietitian. You know, they are experts in that field. Um, <clears throat> which one of our patients would it be really impair, uh, important to have blood pressure control? Would it be the acute pyelonephritis or the chronic pyelonephritis? Hopefully, you said chronic. Very good. See, you're paying attention. All right. Oh, I am done. This is how I feel. I can only imagine how you feel too. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and just shoot me an email. Otherwise, you are done and have a great day.